three. The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 864 for Monday, April 5th, 2021. Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you send in your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. We process all those. We ingest those. Not, not literally, but, you know, intellectually, we ingest those. We try to answer your questions. We share your tips. We share your cool stuff found. The goal is that each of us gets to eat. Wait, wait. Each of us gets to learn at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include Clear, where the code MacGeekGab uh, at clearme.com with the code MacGeekGab will get you two free months of their service. Great to see travel stuff coming back. Textexpander.com slash podcast, one of my favorite apps. And helixsleep.com slash MGG, the thing that is responsible for me being up and alert and ready to go for this show. We'll talk more in depth about each of them later. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. All right, Mr. John F. Braun down in Fairfield, Connecticut. Fairfield doing okay these days? You, uh, everything kind of moving along all right? Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, went to the uh, health department to do do that thing this week. And, cool. Uh, That's excellent. Everything seems okay. That's good. That's good. I'm glad, man. Yeah, it's great. We're all getting, you know, moving forward through this crazy thing. Like I said, we can... We even have a sponsor today that's talking about travel, which is, you know, like mm. that hasn't happened for a year. So that's pretty exciting if you ask me. Uh, and I know you didn't ask me, but I'm just sharing. It's what we do on this show. We share things. Um, Alex has a quick tip to share. He says, here's a fun finder tip. Uh, if you go into system preferences, general highlight color, uh, you, as you might know, you can pick a highlight color. In my case, I have a pastel blue, but it's hard to find the right color when the color picker window is on top. But here is a little trick that will allow for a pseudo dynamic interaction a tad better than picking a color and then switching to the finder window to learn if the color will work for you or not. Ah, right. Because you're picking a color, then you need to see. But the color, if the finder window is not up front, it's not selected. So you don't get to tell. So here are the steps. He says, go to system preferences, general highlight color. And in the drop down, choose other, then click on a finder window and select some icons. Notice your finder window must remain active to keep it active. Uh, hold down the command key while moving the color sliders around. Once you let go of a slider, the selection in your finder window will update. Continue to command slide the color controls in the color picker until you find the color that you like. What a really smart trick. So it's this command. You, you want to have the windows kind of side by side, the color picker as one and your finder window as the other. But command clicking on that color picker will let you change it without making that the active window. So you get to see the changes in real time, uh, so, sort of real time uh, uh, on the finder. That's brilliant. Thank you, Alex. I love that one. Wow. That's, um, I, I gotta be honest. That's one of those I didn't quite understand until I read it aloud. And now I totally get it. So he does have a, a small warning. He says, it turns out that the color I chose, uh, for the screenshot, he says is, uh, it, it appears invisible in mail dot app. So when going for a very muted windows, double check another app before committing and moving on. I'm, I'm sure you'd stumble into that, but it, it's not just the finder that that highlight color effects mail is another one of those things so you know check it in in other places but thanks for that alex that's um that's a great tip i like that I've, that's always sort of driven me crazy that i have to pick a color and then it's like yeah you know it's good enough but this lets you get better than good enough so thanks man it's good it's good it's Speaking good of mail yes sir so you suggest that i look at this uh to maybe address an issue that i've had um <clears throat> So I'll just dive in. Um, oh, yeah. Part of our workflow is that we take the email and we output it to a PDF and then that gets put into Evernote. Um, for whatever reason, I think it's when mail, yeah. So when mail renders the PDF, it will use um, 
color-coded text for multi-level discussions. The problem is the default choice uh, for one of the colors, uh, at least on my display, looks uh, look, it, it's very hard to read. It's like a, a green, a light green against white, and it's mm. just hard to read. So the tip there is change your color quoted text if you're going to output to a PDF. And where do we do that? Uh, we do that in mail, preferences, fonts, and colors. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. a good, yeah. Yeah. So now I, so purple and teal are my two colors and green is level three. I should okay. probably not make that green either, but. Um, yeah, that green you know, on I white. I could so green on white is hard to read. I'm with you on that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now, you know, I thought Evernote would let me solve the problem. So I, I was just looking through the Evernote menus for whatever reason today, Dave, and uh, they have a dark mode. I'm like, oh, let me try that. Uh, it doesn't work. Yeah, because it you're you're looking at PDFs inside of Ever Evernote. If yes. you if you had just the raw text in there, that might work better. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Or run mail in dark mode. Uh, and then and Can then, I? Oh, I, but I don't know one. if the yeah. PDFs would render in dark mode or not. To be perfectly honest, I think they would not. I, I think I've tried the machine that, that I before. generate the PDFs on is running in dark mode, and yes, okay, that, that. so that confirms that. So running mail in dark mode doesn't help. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if anybody knows how to get mail to render PDFs in dark mode, uh, you well, and and by dark mode I mean with a dark background, light colored text. Let us know feedback at macgeekgab.com. He said feedback at macgeekgab. Com. That's right. If you have questions or tips or anything to send in feedback at MacGeekUp.com. All right. Uh, this is good. This, I love these quick tips. Matt has another one for us. Matt, uh, Matt says, friends, I frequently will grab the icon at the top of a document to drag and drop it to a new folder or into an email or some such. So, for example, let's say you're in pages, right? And you have a document open. There's, it shows you the little preview icon next to its name at the top of that menu. You can grab that and drag it anywhere. And like he said, into a mail message, into the finder to put it somewhere else. And it treats just like it, it's treated just as if you had done that in the finder. So dragging it around, which is great. He says, however, it really annoyed me that the icon was not there in Big Sur's preview app. They've hidden it from me. So I couldn't figure out what to do to search for help. So I trial and errored it uh, and found the answer. If you hover over the or or click on the name of the document in preview, voila, the icon appears. He says, sometimes clicking opens the dropdown to change the name or location. And I haven't quite figured out the fine touch for which type of click does what, but hovering over it and waiting a second, the icon will appear and then you can drag from there. So thanks for that, Matt. That's yep. Another one of those things. You know, we, um, we like stuff when it, um, when it works the way we're used to, but sometimes the new way is better. We just have to get used to it. That's sort of the trick, isn't it? I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. I know. All right. Uh, moving along, John. Indeed. Okay. Patrick says, um, on the M1 Max, to boot into recovery mode, press and hold the power button on your Mac until you see the startup options, and then click options. And then when you're in recovery mode, you can run the startup security utility, which will allow you to switch between full security and reduced security. And in reduced security, you have two options. The first thing is that full security allows only the current operating system or a signed operating system currently trusted by Apple to run. Um, and it requires a network connection when you're installing software. So bear that in mind. That's full security. Reduced security allows any version of a signed operating system software or uh, ever trusted by Apple to run. And then there's two checkboxes. Allow user management of kernel extensions from identified developers, which you can check on or off, and allow remote management of kernel extensions and automatic software updates. So depending on how you're using your, your Mac, especially your M1 Mac, you may want to go in and do this so that you can set 
your uh, security policies in a way that they will work for you. So there you go. We, we are still um, hearing that M1 Max, I, I need to test this on, on mine, uh, that they will, they will boot from external drives uh, without making a change to security settings. Uh, but, but there's, there's some caveats there. In fact, uh, Simon brings up one of those caveats and that is, he said, you know, I was listening to 862 where you were talking about booting from an external SSD. He says for M1 Max reports from people like uh, Mike at Carbon Copy Cloner and Howard Oakley at Eclectic Light suggest that you need to use Thunderbolt drives for external boot on an M1 Mac. USB drives aren't always as reliable in being bootable from M1 Macs. Again, all this evidence is anecdotal, he says, and I will quote Kelly Gumont, the plural of anecdote is not data, but in the absence of data, we will use the anecdotes. Uh, and it, he says this anecdotal evidence seems to show that Big Sur, Big Sur, especially on M1, does not always play well with USB boot devices. So hopefully this is only limited to M1, but it makes me want to test my USB drive that I'm cloning to down in the office because uh, because I want to you know, I want to make sure that, uh, that I can boot, you, you know, one thing we did not say for world backup week, John, uh, last week was this, and that is test your backups regularly. I don't think we said this last week. And if we did, it bears repeating backing things up is great, but knowing how to restore from them is also equally as important because if you're in pressure cooker mode, you want to be able to know that, ah, I have some muscle memory of how to boot from my clone or how to restore data from time machine or one of those things. It's, it's, and it also confirms that your backups are working as intended when you don't need them. And that's sort of another important thing. So make sure you test your backups. All right. That was a lot about uh, M1 security and Thunderbolt versus USB booting. And, and of course, backups. Do you have any thoughts on any of that, John? Um, Carbon Copy Cloner does have a verification feature. <clears throat> yes, to verify that the data is there for sure. That doesn't help with muscle memory, though, right? Like, no, right. knowing that it's there, trusting that it's there. It's, I mean, that don't get me wrong. That's great. But knowing how to do it and having done it, like, I think there's two different things between knowing how to do it and having done it. Perfect example. Mm -hmm. I could sit here and explain to everyone how a clutch on a stick shift works, but unless you've done it, you are almost certainly going to stall the car the first time you try it after hearing me mm -hmm. explain it to you. <laughs> like it is, it is all but a guarantee. <laughs> and in fact, if you're like me, you probably will stall it again decades later because it's just how those things work if you're not doing it regularly enough. So yeah, having that, having that muscle memory is a good thing. <laughs> <sighs> but it is kind of fun driving a stick. My wife, um, it was, it was one of our pandemic purchases was to get rid of the, um, the big family. Um, we had an SUV for a while. The most recently was a Toyota Highlander and it was, it was time, you know, to, to move past that. I have a vehicle, I have an Outback, a Subaru Outback that's perfect for my drums and anything we need to cart around. And so she, she, downsized her vehicle to a, a, w, a stick shift WRX, which she really likes. So, <sighs> all right. I don't know why. How, how are we here? Okay. Um, one last thing on this note, it seems like there's a, there's a lot of M1 Max stuff today, which is good, uh, is that Steve shares something that would probably be called the cool stuff found in any other episode. But since we are saving cool stuff found for 865 and I wanted it in this one, we'll call it a quick tip. Uh, is Otherworld Computing's guide to the startup modes on M1. It's a great article, and we will link to it in the show notes. It it shows everything about that we currently know about all the uh, startup modes for M1 Max, and uh, and so I've put that in the show notes for all of you. And it it really is mostly very simple that you hold down the power button as it's starting up and then you are brought to a menu. But there are a few different things I was having. I was doing some troubleshooting this week, which actually I'll share this. I'll share the result of it. But I was doing some troubleshooting and I wanted to boot into safe mode. 
And the way that you do that is you wait until the drives, you do the power button, hold the power button down, let the startup options menu come up, wait until the volume or volumes uh, appear that are startup a bull. And then you have to hold down the shift key. And that's not entirely clear at that point. So they've been clear. They are clearer now, but you hold down the shift key and then it will, it, it, the screen will change much like holding down the option key and looking in menus. The screen will change when you hold down the shift key to change and say, boot this drive in safe mode and you click it and, and off it goes. So, um, but we, the link explains all of it. It's really a, a fantastic resource uh, that talks through the obvious ones and the not so obvious ones. And Steve Sandy wrote it. So, you know, it's got to be good. Um, but my weird problem, John, was this. I am actually getting ready to travel. Uh, have Vax will travel, uh, which is true. But also uh, we have to go pick up our son and move him out of his dorm. So uh, we were going to travel anyway, but it's nice to nice to be able to do it a little more safely. Um, so we're, we're heading out to Portland and to and to do that, which means I will be living on my M1 macbook air as my daily driver for about a week and that's that's going to be a first of course for me so um about a week ago of course i started having a problem where one password would not work in safari on my air and since one password is my password manager my primary one and safari is my primary browser this was a minor annoyance a week ago, a couple of days ago, it started to get me into panic mode. Cause it's like, wait a minute, I need to rely on this thing. Like business doesn't stop while I'm traveling. Um, I mean, I'll pass some stuff off, but I'm, I'm really not good at detaching folks. And while I appreciate Safari and one passwords, uh, conspiratorial effort to get me to detach more, I needed to thwart it. And, um, and so I did a lot of troubleshooting back and forth with them. It's why I tried safe mode. They were convinced that something else was running on my Mac that was getting in the way, which is a, a reasonable thing. They were like, what other Safari plugins do you have? Yada, yada, yada. And I don't know what made me think to check this, but we were four days into this troubleshooting process. And, you know, the panic was starting to mount a little bit. And it hit me. I'm like, wait a minute. Let me look at how I have Safari running. And so I went into the fi the finder, I did file, get info, John, and I saw the open in Rosetta box was checked mm. for Safari. I'm sure I did that to mess with some flash thing or something probably a long time ago and never thought to uncheck it. I had even, this persisted through a reinstall, an over-the-top reinstall of Big Sur. So I had downloaded Big Sur, I reinstalled it over the top thinking maybe there was some resource that was missing, which in a sense, I guess there was. Uh, because I had told it to be missing, but um, it persisted through that, like that, whatever, whatever holds that setting happily held that setting through a reinstall of, of Big Sur. And, uh, and so I, you know, I unchecked the box and the problem I immediately went away. And the symptom, just in case you all see it, was that I would, it, it would not work at all in Safari, but I would see the one password toolbar icon briefly appear and then disappear. So I obviously told the one password folks about this and recommended that they should detect for this. And if they can't gracefully, you know, fall back to Rosetta mode at the very least, send up a warning for the user like, hey, you're in Rosetta mode in Safari. So I'm running in Apple Silicon mode. You're running in Intel mode for whatever reason. The two ne'er shall meet and you need to change that if you want me to work stop it would have saved uh, a lot of time for me and for them over the course of four days so hopefully they're working on that but i thought that was really weird uh mm -hmm. you know uh a quick work workaround when i have run into this um yeah sometimes password managers just have a hiccup it's like oh what do i do now um this is where i like hand off dave <clears throat> okay so what i've done in some cases is so I'm surfing on my Mac um, and it doesn't fill in the username or password properly. I'm like, oh man. Yep. So what you can do is run it on your iOS device. Use, you know, use the, the app yep. on the iOS app, go to the page for whatever entry it is and then copy the password okay. on your iOS device and then go to your Mac and paste it. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a feature of handoff that I don't yeah. know if everybody knows about, but you can copy and paste between the uh, devices that are connected to iCloud and are somewhat near each other. I think it uses Bluetooth, so you can't do it from like great distances. But if you happen to have your iPhone next to you and things are acting up on the Mac, um, keep that in mind. That can that can help. So Warren in the chat room and I have the same thought about this because I was I was literally running into this problem and all I was doing was running the one password app on my Mac and copying and pasting from there. So I didn't have to like move my hands to another device. And I, I as Warren says, LastPass also has a native app for the Mac. So w why not just use am I miss? Are we missing something or is this just a, a yet another way of looking at it? Uh, yeah. OK. OK, <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, great. I, we have all kinds of questions. We have more tips. We have, yes, but no cool stuff found today. That will be next week. I promise. I promise. Scout's honor. All right. Uh, I want to talk about our sponsors, John, if that works for you, my friend. Please do. All right. I can't wait to be able to travel again. I can't wait till we all can travel again because one of the things I love about travel is I get to see some of you when we get together at conferences and trade shows and things like that. And that is why I am so excited about Clear, who is our next sponsor here. I've been using Clear for years. And Clear is this secure identity platform that creates this super frictionless journey at the airport. It allows me to move faster through airport security. And the cool part is with clear, all I need is me. All you need is you after a quick one-time enrollment. And it truly is super quick. You'd get to use your face or your eyes for safer touchless entry at airports, of course, in stadiums and more. I've only been able to use it at airports and it's amazing. It's, it's like so smooth and easy. It's fantastic. You create your account online before going to the airport. Once you get there, a friendly ambassador helps you finish the process and then you can use Clear immediately with over five and a half million people who are already using it. I am very eager to be able to use this again, especially now. Clear is the absolute best way to help you get back to what you love. They have locations in over 35 airports across the country, making it safer, easier, and faster to reunite with your loved ones or take that much needed vacation. It works great with PreCheck too. And right now for a limited time, you can get your first two months of clear for free. And you do that by going to clearme.com slash MacGeekGab and use code MacGeekGab. So you got to use the whole code. That's C-L-E-A-R-M-E dot com slash MacGeekGab. Code MacGeekGab for your first two months of Clear for free. Clearme.com slash MacGeekGab. Code MacGeekGab. And our thanks to Clear for doing what they do and sponsoring this episode. Next up is Text Expander. This is one of my favorite apps. I, I, I can't live without it. And I proved that to myself this week. I was doing some troubleshooting completely unrelated to Text Expander, but, you know, honoring the troubleshooting process, I quit everything, including Text Expander. <laughs> yeah, well, not for long because I felt like I had mittens on while I was trying to type all the things that I do, all the things that have become muscle memory. So many of them are reliant on Text Expander because what Text Expander lets me do and can let you do is you create these snippets of text. They can be fully fledged like emails or little bits of responses or even things as simple as an email address. How many times do you type your email address and you got to, you know, it like typing an email address requires the shift key and that, you know, it's like a weird little thing that you got to dance with your hands. Not me. I don't do that dance. I type like, you know, DTMO and that puts my David Mac observer address right there in an email. And I definitely never fat finger it. I never spell it wrong. No problems. And you can do that with all kinds of things, including huge, long, like customer service replies. You can even have text expander, pull in uh, things from the clipboard, or it can even prompt you to enter stuff. It's fantastic. You get to get your message right every time and show listeners, because you listen to Mac geek gab, you get 20% off your first year by visiting textexpandercom slash podcast. That's where you got to go. I know it sounds generic. It is textexpandercom slash podcast. You get 20% off your first year. They'll ask you which podcast during the checkout process. I think you already know the answer to that question. So our thanks to text expander 
for sponsoring this episode. You know what I have realized after having our Helix mattress, who is our next sponsor here in our house and in our, my bedroom for the last six months or so is this is the first mattress that I am like really comfortable hanging out in. I wake up and I, I just still want to stay in bed. I know we all want to stay in bed, but it's more than that with this Helix mattress for us. It, it's just like, oh, I wake up and I'm, it's comfortable. It's, it's not just comfortable for sleeping, but it's really comfortable for sleeping, but it's just comfortable for hanging out in. And I think that's because it's, it's like the right amounts of, of everything to support me and be cozy and, and supportive. And it's amazing what they've done. And I think a big part of that is that Helix has a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and your sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. It's true. Lisa and I both did the quiz. Thankfully, we both came up with the same answer, but but you answer about your partner too. So it, it it's no surprise that we both came up with the same answer. It's very cool, very, very cool the way that that they do it. And you can take the quiz yourself too. You just go to helixsleep.com slash MGG and they'll match you to your customized mattress too. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash MGG. So just go to helixsleep.com slash MGG, do the quiz, figure out your mattress, and you're good to go. Our thanks to Helix Sleep for sponsoring this episode. All right, Dave, let's go to Kevin. Kevin has a mystery. Okay. Um. And that file vault is mysteriously being turned off, or at least that's the title here. But um, Kevin says, years ago when I bought my 2014 MacBook Pro, one of the first things I did with the new machine was turn on file vault. It took several hours to encrypt the disk. Um, back then, yes. Um, I saved a screenshot of the recovery key and I haven't thought about it again in years. Fast forward to this morning when I was looking through security and privacy in system preferences and saw that file vault is turned off. I didn't turn it off, and I don't know any way it could have been turned off. Uh, I'm very puzzled. A bit of Google Foo turned up, turned up nothing about File Vault being disabled without your permission. Here's my only theory, and I think it's a good one. About a year ago, the internal SSD was nearly full, and I purchased a larger one. I cloned the original SSD to the new one using Carbon Copy Cloner and an external enclosure. Then I swapped out the original SSD for the larger one, since Carbon copy cloners, file level copy, I assume that swapping the physical SSDs resulted in the new one not being encrypted. If that's the case, then I have to turn on file vault again and encrypt the new SSD. If that's not the case, I'm completely at a loss. Um, I, I would say uh, his suspicion is correct in that making a clone results in an unencrypted drive that you then have to re-encrypt. Um, I ran into, uh, just as an aside here, um, I did run into something similar, Dave, when I went from my MacBook Pro 2012 to the 2019 and that file vault wasn't enabled. Mm. Um, but um, here, here's the caveat. I just thought I'd mention this. It was just more like FYI for Kevin. Um, but since this machine has the T2 security chip, Dave, as far as I know, by default, it encrypts the drive. That's my understanding too, is that the, the drive is encrypted, but when you use it, which, which is what makes the, the file vault encryption and decryption processes instantaneous. Um, what mm -hmm. I, what I understand though, is that if you use file vault, the key to unlock that is not stored in your T2 chip, or at least there's another key. Maybe it's, maybe it is stored in the T2 chip, but to unlock that key, there's something either at the OS level or that's stored in iCloud that you need to decrypt that drive. So it does add a layer of individualized security when you turn on file vault, but you're right. The data itself is encrypted, but the T2 chip has the key uh, regard it, it, the data is encrypted regardless. And then the T2 chip is there. So, yeah. Yeah. I think what happened is, so I, I enabled file vault and it enabled it like instantly, which is definitely not how it worked in the past. In sure. the past, it would show you a, you know, progress bar and it would take hours. Whereas right. here it's, 
Yeah, so you get some added bonus features if you enable it on a T2 chip, as you just pointed out. So, yeah, it's just sort of how that um, goes. Yeah. Yeah, and then to continue, just an FYI for people that run into the same sort of thing here. Um, so he went to turn on File Vault, and then he got this dialogue saying, Recovery key. A recovery key has been set by your computer, by your company, school, or institution. Uh, hmm. Okay. That's interesting. It sounds like it's almost part of like some, it's a managed machine yeah. that, that they're mentioning school or institution or company. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so when he got that, he clicked on a continue, but, but he never got a recovery key. So okay. he, uh, I guess, turned it off and then turned it back on again. <laughs> sure. Um, but as a follow-up, so he found out, I think, why this happened. So he figured it out and thought he'd share what he found. And, and in case anyone else gets caught, it turns out that when you restore a clone of a file vault encrypted drive, the newly restored drive is unencrypted, but it contains files about the old recovery keys in the keychains folder. Uh, removing those files will reset the system and allow you to start the file vault process from scratch. Um, Interesting. Stack Exchange article that goes into that. So we'll link to that article. But yeah, so it's an article what to do if you get this message, which is an odd message. Again, I thought yeah. if I got this message, I would think that there was a configuration profile somewhere. Sure. Because Apple does have school and institution and company management. Um, well, not anymore. They used to. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, I mean, it still exists. It just not managed by Apple the same way you would use. Generally, you would use a third party mm -hmm. tool to do it. Right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Warren in the in the chat room says that um, File Vault is not on by default for a T2 chip for the reasons that we discussed here. Uh, and he says he doesn't use it for his stuff. He's found nothing but problems. Warren does a lot of consulting for people. It's, that's his that's his gig. And uh, he says, but since the drive is soldered in, it's probably okay, which which makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because it's not you're not changing it out and and potentially having those issues. So, cool. The chat room, of course, is at live.macgeekgab.com, uh, and you can join us anytime we are recording the show. You get a little sneak peek at what the episode's going to become, and you get a little before pre-show and post-show discussion too, which is. Uh, well, it's sometimes very interesting uh, and sometimes not. I would assume your mileage may vary. Uh, mm -hmm. Brian uh, has back to the what seems to be a theme of M1 Max today. Brian says um, talking about Mac Geek 862, where there was um, listener Mike who was talking about his M1 Mac that was bricked uh, because of a few things he did. He said, I recently bought an M1 Air and had an Aki USB-C hub uh, that was a powered Thunderbolt hub. I immediately started having kernel panics at random times. A day or two later, Apple released that patch of macOS 11.2.2 that Mike mentioned to prevent non-compliant powered hubs from damaging MacBooks running Big Sur. Unfortunately, the damage for me was already done. I continued to get random kernel panics even after installing the patch says it turns out this patch was primarily meant to prevent MacBooks from being bricked. However, the level two tech to whom I spoke suggested that random kernel panics were a less frequent symptom of hardware damage. Luckily, Apple agreed to let me swap out my air, even though I was one day past the 14 day return window. Mike's story reminded me of my experience. If he continues to have problems, he may be able to get Apple to replace his M1 mini. After all, Apple is somewhat responsible for the whole mess. Somewhat. Yeah, that's fair. Cool. That's good to know. Thank you, Brian. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that the 11 seems that 11.2.2 for this is preventative, not uh, not restorative in that sense. I don't know what the right verb would be to mm. use. So anyway, uh, cool. Thank you for that. Uh, speaking of M1 minis, John, I um, I have a, an M1 mini on the way. I uh, I was not planning on buying another Mac until the iMacs came out. And to be fair, I have not bought another Mac. But I had a domain uh, that I bought last year in quarantine with, you know, some uh, distant back burner ideas of maybe a business in the future or something. I thought it was a good domain. And so I bought it and, uh, and then someone came to me and said, we want to buy your domain. And as always, I tell anyone that wants to buy one of my domains, it's 10 grand. 
Now, I know that this domain is not worth 10 grand, but it keeps me from having to deal with the people that want to pay me 50 bucks for a domain that I'm that I've clearly invested at least a little bit of time and a little bit of money into procuring. And so they kept up the conversation and they said, yeah, we don't have 10 grand for this particular business. Um, we also don't think the domain's worth that, but we have something in which you might be interested. A brand new two terabyte, 16 gig M1 mini. And I thought, huh, of course I'm answering this, e these emails from my 2014 uh, OG retina iMac that is mm, having days where it is slow. Uh, it, so it was like, you know, maybe that's not such a bad idea. So I, uh, I did the trade, the things on its way. The problem with this is that I'm very used to looking at an Apple 5k retina screen all day. And so I needed, and I have my second monitor is, you know, either a monoprice or a ViewSonic, depending on whether I'm in the office or the studio. 4K UHD 27 inch screen. They look great, but having them next to Apple's 5K retina screen, it's obvious that great and even better, uh, even greater, I should say, is, is the accurate comparison. And so I also have ordered a refurb from Amazon LG 5K display. So my domain trade for a Mac one, an M1 mini is uh, so far costing me about 950 bucks. So uh, so, you know, but whatever, like, it's fine. It's fine. It's something to do. It's, you know, so I'm excited though. Uh, and I'm really eager to see how 16 gigs in an M one works for me as my daily driver that I think that machine downstairs has 40 gigs of Ram in it. Cause I just, you know, like I didn't max it out. I think I could have gone more, but you know, I, I put lots in when I got it. Obviously I can't do that with the, the M one mini, but we also need to think about Ram differently with the M one max than we have previously. So I'm, I'm eager to, to learn. And, uh, and this, this LG five K display won't go to waste. And let's be perfectly honest. I wasn't going to use that domain anyway, or at least not anytime soon. So there you go. Yep. Uh, and, and, and to answer the question, I just got in a text message here. <laughs> it's probably a bad idea to answer, but I'll answer it anyway. The domain was slash is set and setting dot co. I will let you interpret that on your own time. Uh, but there you go. So, all right. Uh, any thoughts on any of that? Should we moving on? No. Moving on to Rodney. So I'll, I'll let you know what I think about them. When one mini once I start using it. So moving on to Rodney, John. So Rodney, uh, this is one from the mists of time. Rodney asks, I was wondering if I could with USB ethernet adapters run two ethernet connections at the same time on my two Macs. Um, so we'd like to do internet. Okay. A uh, second one for time machine backups. And I'd like to set one Mac as a file share for backups with my existing USB drive and not purchase a network share drive. Is such a setup possible? Because I don't want to get caught. Um, yes, I think so. So if I understand what's being asked about the Ethernet connection, Dave. Um, you can combine Ethernet ports um, on a Mac. Sure. Cool, huh? Yeah. Um, and where I'd look for some additional direction on how to do this is Apple has a dandy little article called Combine Ethernet Ports into a Virtual Port on the Mac. And I'll let you guys check that out if you want to combine them because you can potentially get increased network throughput by using multiple connections. Uh, some switches support this as well. Uh, our Synology's support multi ethernet port synologies typically support this so um uh if it's uh, if if you feel the need for speed then yes you can do it um as for time machine um this also i think you can do and uh we we've you know i'll paste the the path here but basically you, you can do file sharing on your mac but you can also make it a time machine specific file share and for that you go to system preferences file sharing shared folders then right click on the shared folder i guess it could be a drive um advanced options share as time machine destination mm -hmm. say that five times fast <laughs> so so as far as i can tell yes you can do both of those things i interpreted this a little bit differently I, and 
And so okay. I'll take it in a different direction. You know, when he said he wanted mm -hmm. to have two ethernet connections and he said, I want to have one for my internet connection as normal in a second for time machine backups. I started thinking he wanted to have two completely different ethernet networks running which you can also do. You nope. don't have to combine them and bond them into one. Um, you you can have different IP ranges accessible via different network adapters on your Mac. And I specifically say different network adapters as opposed to different Ethernet adapters because your Wi-Fi network can be on a different network than your Ethernet. Once, you know, once it, once they're at that point, it's abstracted out. The the system doesn't care whether it's hardware, or software, or or hardwired or or wireless. They are both network adapters. And yes, you can do this with multiple Ethernet adapters too. Now, as you pointed out, John, you can certainly run Time Machine across the same Ethernet backbone that you run your internet connection on, and that's totally fine. But if you have a reason to want them separate um, for perhaps security reasons, you know, security or, or something else, then you definitely can. And you, you would just set up two separate network adapters in there. And you would give them each different IP ranges. You could even have two different routers on them so that you had the ability to, you know, uh, and different subnets and, and all of that and and choose which way you want things to go. Uh, but that all works. I, I've never, I probably have done it with two Ethernet connections. Oh, I actually definitely did. I used IP net router, which is a piece of software I hadn't thought of in decades, and then we mentioned, or a listener, one of you mentioned two weeks ago or something, but I used IP net router on my Macs before there were consumer grade routers. And I my Mac was my router, and I had one Ethernet connection for, you know, to my cable modem and the other to my network, and it was my router. And I used two obviously different subnets and all that stuff. Um the other thing that I far more commonly use, uh dual network connections for is when I'm setting up or testing a new wireless router, uh, I can set that up without connecting it to the internet. Like I can just have a wireless router connected to power only fire it up and then I can connect to it wirelessly. And now I've got its subnet wireless and it, and my Mac knows how to talk to that router that way. But my Mac also knows how to talk to the internet via my other Ethernet connection. And so I can download firmware for it and push it over to the router without ever having to plug that router in to Ethernet. And there are times when, you know, testing things and stuff, it makes perfect sense to do exactly that. So, um, so yeah, your Mac is totally capable. If your question was, is my Mac capable of managing two separate network connections? The answer is yes. And we're just giving you a couple examples as to what those might be. So... I'm not sure which way he was asking his question, but figured we'd answer it both ways. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Um, any more on that? Or is it time to go to Joe? Nope. Go to Joe. Go to Joe. Joe asks on Twitter, uh, which is at, at Mac Geek Gab on Twitter, and you're likely to see a lot more activity on our Twitter. We've uh, actually hired Sadie here at Backbeat Media to start managing managing some of our social media and specifically with the goal of expanding our, our audience. And so finding new ways to reach potential new members of the Mac Geek Cab family here. So, uh, but that, that being said, so on Twitter, of course, we're at Mac Geek Cab Instagram. We're at Mac Geek Cab too. We'd love if you followed us over there. We're chopping up little segments of the show and sharing some quick tips and stuff that way. So we'd love it if you, uh, if you check that out. So anyway, Joe says, Several of the WD red hard drives in my Synology disk station are reporting power on times of 42,000 hours. Only one of them is reporting any bad sectors, 151 of them to be exact. How many is too many on both of these numbers? And when is it time to start ordering replacements? I do have a hot spare in place ready to step in in the event of an emergency. So, yeah, with, with Synology disk stations, if you have the drive bays and you can afford to have a drive sitting there unused, I absolutely recommend and love the hot spare concept because if a drive dies while you are away or whatever, it just takes over. And I've, I've tested this both intentionally and unintentionally, and it works great. If you just go yank a drive out of your, out of your disk station, the hot spare takes over. It's awesome. So, uh, to answer the first question about his power on time, 42,000 hours, let's remember that, uh, 
I looked at the Western Digital Red spec sheet and it said that those drives are all rated at 1 million hours mtbf mean time between failure so you are not anywhere close joe so you have no issues there now as for those 151 bad sectors if i had a drive with 151 and this is really the best way for me to answer this question i would watch it every month to see if that number is increasing 151 isn't a lot I've had, in fact, I probably have drives in service that have about that many, somewhere in the less than 200 range, uh, and they have done fine for years. The trick is if that number changes. So now you know it's 151 because you, you documented it on Twitter, and now we've documented it here. So check it every month and see if that 151 is changing. Your Synology will probably report any changes to you uh, for this very reason, but Keep an eye on it. And if it stays at 151, you're fine. When it starts to grow, and it will, uh, then that's the time to start thinking about replacing it. So that's how I approach those things. Uh, I could be very, very wrong, but I don't think I am. I, you know, in that I haven't run into ca catastrophic issues doing that. So there you go. How about you, John? How, how would you approach this? Um. Yeah, I've done the pretty much same thing. Uh, the Synology will pick it up and look at the number. And if it gets bigger, then that's bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Ch changes are more of a problem. But I've had other cases where there's there's like a few bad blocks and it, and it you know, reallocates them. Uh, all drives do this to some degree. Yeah. And, um, and then everything's great. But sometimes uh, it spirals into disaster so. into disaster <laughs> yes that's exactly it yeah 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 I, I i well yeah just keep an eye on the number and, and if it's changing that's the problem it's kind of like when you you know go, when i go to the dermatologist and i show them like a new thing and they'll look at it and say oh good you have a new decoration um that's what my guy calls them decorative he says if it changes let me know or really they'll know too because they you know they check every year whatever it is so yeah it's that kind of thing. So hard drives are the same way. You found something about hard drives, Mr. Braun. Yes, I did. And uh, this is a nice report to look at. And uh, they release it every year. And it's the Backblaze hard drive stats for 2020. Um, so if you don't know, Backblaze uh, does backup services. And they have tons of drives. Um <laughs> at their disposal, like hundreds of thousands uh, from what I can see on their table here. Um, so this is just something useful to look at. Uh, they they show the brand, the bottle. Um, the only thing that jumped out at me, Dave, so you got to be careful of this. Uh, you know, I had to... Uh, one of the drives here, uh, a Seagate 18 terabyte, they show an AFR of 12.5%. And I'm like, wow, that's terrible, which it is, I think. A AFR in the grand meaning? scheme of things. Now, here's the thing, though. John, yeah, so AFR, so that, yes, that number does not mean that 12% of the drives failed uh, necessarily, but it's annualized failure rate is wow. what AFR is. Yeah. And it's just a measure. Now, the thing is, uh, when you look, at the other numbers so two out of 60 drives failed okay that's technique so uh, i wouldn't read too much into this because 60 is a very small sample size <laughs> the stats on the other drives that they have hundreds or thousands or in some cases tens of thousands of uh, i think give a, a better uh, overall picture of the drive reliability yeah but, interesting Right. And and those drives, they only had in service for three months, too. So to have two drives out of 60 fail within the first three months, like it, like you said, it's important to look at all the data mm -hmm. on the chart. That tells me they got two drives from a bad batch. I, I mean, yes, they, like like mm -hmm. almost certainly, you know, it's a slightly unfair. Again, the data is all there. You can interpret it. I, I would think correctly. But if you like you said, if you just look at that annualized failure rate column, you're like, wow. That's terrible, but you know, it's not, the, it's not as terrible as it looks. Hopefully we'll find out over time. Yeah. So, and yeah. And if you know statistics, you know, that one important aspect when you do an experiment or measure something is the sample size and the larger, the better. And in this case, uh, it wasn't very large. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Right. And that one for that one drive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I believe mm -hmm. that is just so folks looking. Um, I believe that is the Exo Seagate drive, the 18 terabyte, which I haven't tested. We've tested the 16s here. And, uh, you know, I've got lots of those. Well, several of those in service. Um, and and those are rated as, you know, I think 2 million MTBF, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So, you know, Seagate would would definitely uh, replace those, especially I mean, they would replace any drive that failed in the first three months. So, um, yeah, fascinating that the 18s that that happened with the 18s. I didn't even know the 18s were out, but I don't pay that close of attention. So maybe the back place people are able to get drives that are not quite available for the rest of us. So, all right. Yeah, I always buy the biggest drive I can because I know that I'm going to I know I'm going to fill it up. It's just how I go. All right. Uh, while we're on the subject of drives, let's dive in a little bit to Robert here. And Robert says, um, as SSD drives or SSDs are continuing to get bigger and cheaper, I'm tempt tempted to replace my USB external two and a half inch rotational backups, a uh, mix of WDs and Seagates with external USB SSDs uh, for use with carbon copy cloner, etc. But I keep stumbling into information online that SSDs, unlike rotational drives, can decay and lose their data after only a year of not being plugged in. Now, I know that rotational drives can have mechanical issues if not plugged in for a long time and are damaged more easily by heat and humidity, but the magnetic data can, worst case, still be recovered, although it's expensive. What is the truth about SSDs? If I have to make sure a drive is plugged in every few months, the, that will make me think a lot more before switching to SSDs for the archive backups I stick in a drawer or a bank vault and forget about for a long time. Uh, okay, so this is interesting. Um the first thing to note is that rotational drives are not nearly as impermeable or unsusceptible to long-term damage from sitting idle than, than you would indicate. As I understand it, if a drive is on the shelf for a rotational drive is on the shelf for more than six months, the earth's magnetic pull can even begin to have uh, bit rot effects on the, the drive that has not spun in a long time. So I would, I would not leave your hard drives for that kind of archival storage either. In fact, I wouldn't leave anything for that kind of archival storage. I mean, there's some of those CDs and, and oh, what's the name? Maybe somebody in the chat room can help remind me of the type of, of CDs or DVDs, sorry, that are supposed to last a really long time. We talked about it in Cool Stuff Found recently. Uh, but, um, but it, you know, I, I would, I, I would beware trusting anything. Honestly, I would put it on, I, if you have stuff that you need to save, I would put it on some kind of active device, either, you know, cloud storage, like, like, you know, Amazon Glacier or, you know, one of those slow, but, but, um, slow to retrieve from, but, you know, maintained, I think is perhaps the right word. And so you can have, you can pay Amazon to maintain it, or you can maintain it yourself on either, you know, like a, a NAS, like a Synology or QNAP or whatever, or a JBOD, like you get from OWC with just a bunch of disks in it. And, uh, and, you know, let let that do the management but i i wouldn't trust anything that's just sitting uh including an ssd now that said i've had ssds you know on ice unplugged for well more than a year and they mounted up just fine and the data all appeared to be there just fine but as we said earlier in the show you know the plural of anecdote is not data um and, and i wouldn't i don't it's not i'm not using those drives with data that I trust the data that I need to trust rather goes on my disk station. And then that's backed up either to the cloud or to at least another disk station, depending on what the data is. So yeah, multiple sources of your data really is the best. I, I, I don't know. I, that's, that's sort of my thought on that, John. What, what, what do you think? I remember digging into this. Uh, Tom's hardware actually has a discussion about this. Mm. And yeah, someone mentioned that some standard, says that SSDs at a certain temperature should last at least a year without any activity. 
Um, but the art of the goal also makes a, a, a good suggestion as well is think, uh, now if you're talking archival, which is what was said here. Yeah. To me, archival is like long-term things. And I think you mentioned, yeah, that, that, that there are services that that's what they, the, uh, Amazon has something, right? I think you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Amazon Glacier. I was reading this. Yeah. 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 And that's the intent of that service is, is archival storage. Um, but you may also want to consider, uh, I've used many different ones. Like I actually used tape back in the day when tape was, uh, digital audio tape was popular for backups. And I think you can still use digital audio tape. Right? Sure, sure. Um, uh, there are also several uh, CD, DVD, Blu-ray formats that will hold on to data for many years last I checked, uh, though, though they will degrade, you know, the dyes in the, uh, in the disc will degrade. So. Right. 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 <clears throat> yep. Um, so, oh, go ahead. No. Oh. No, again, there are multiple options, not just hard drives for, for doing backup, either network or, uh, some alternative media. Like, yeah. You know, I haven't looked at what you can do with tape in ages. I don't even know if <laughs> I could get a tape drive. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, I'm sure I have one. I'm, I have no way of plugging it in. I'm sure it's scuzzy or something like that. But um, yeah, interesting. All right. Um, I am going to break our our no cool stuff found rule because we're talking about this. And I know that we have this queued up for next week is uh, is this from Gary about exactly this kind of thing. So, hey, John and Dave, it's Gary from Pittsburgh, PA again, just wanted to let you know I watched your, or sorry, I listened to your most recent podcast, and you mentioned World Backup Day, and you were talking about other backup solutions. There is a solution that I've recently tried, and so far I like. It's called Polar Backup. If you do a Google search for Polar Backup, they sell five terabytes of data for a one-time fee, and you can still upgrade if you find you're running out of space. They install an app just like Backblaze, Carbonite, and all the other services. But you mentioned you did not like Backblaze. I guess you had problems with it on your Mac. You might want to also give them another chance. They may have fixed their software since then. Anyways, keep up the good work. And don't you guys get caught either. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Yeah. So I look, this Polar Backup is available. It's actually available through one of our deal partners that we use at Mac Observer. So I put a link to that and it's 80 bucks or $79.99 for lifetime five terabytes of backup storage, which is amazingly huge. Like that's a ton of storage. Now I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that's either your lifetime or Polar Backup's lifetime. Um, they don't offer this deal all the time. Because if they did, I can't imagine how they'd stay in business. Um, you know, this is just one of those sort of loss leaders to bring people in, I suppose. Uh, because over time, that's not going to pay off. But uh, five terabytes of, of storage for 80 bucks in the cloud, that's pretty darn good. It, it does appear to only be accessible via their app. So don't look deep. Look more deeply into this if you're thinking about using it for like backing up your disk station or something. It looks like it has to be run as an app from uh, from your Mac. But all that all that being equal, that's a great price. So thank you for that, Gary. Good stuff. Um, John. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I want to throw it. A, a, can I do a quick cool stuff found? Please do. Well, here we go. Um, we were we were uh, uh, in pre show and actually pre pre show talking about IDs. So I'm just going to spit this out. It's a cool stuff found. And what it lets you do is one thing and it does it very well. And I confirm this. It's called Scanner and it lets you scan the barcode on a driver's license and it will tell you what is buried in that barcode. The format of that is open. So the obvious reason would to, would be to check it for, would be to verify someone's age and that's embedded in the barcode but um there is a lot of other data you may find it interesting so all right that's what we got and i'll <laughs> link to the app in the uh that would be more a traditional cool stuff no i found out. this useful i found this useful for a personal project it was like can i make a pretend barcode and the answer is pretty much yes <laughs> yeah Sure. Or at least I was able to figure out how to do that. 
Cool. All right. Well, that would have been a more traditional cool stuff found. I was trying to stay topical here with our, our discussion about hard drives, mm -hmm. but that's okay. Uh, yeah. Dennis uh, has a question about hard drives and specifically about Synology because Synology is making their own drives. And, uh, and he says, why, you know, what do you think about this? Because at the moment, those hard drives are required for use in their um, Synology enterprise disk stations. They're not required in their, um, uh, you know, the consumer grade or even prosumer grade or small business grade uh, disk stations. You can still use those for, you can use any hard drives as, as we've been discussing. So I checked with Synology on this because I wanted to make sure we weren't heading down a path where we had to use Synology branded hard drives in, um, you know, in these disk stations and they confirm it for me that, um, and, and I, I said, I'm sure you're not building your own drives. Where do they come from? And they said they partnered with Toshiba to have these drives produced. And the three newest rack units are requiring the new drives, um, which really isn't all that different from many other enterprise manufacturers. Uh, but at least from the folks I spoke with, they told me there are no plans and they see of no plans to extend this to the DS series or to make this retroactive even for older rack units. So it, you will know when you are buying a Synology, if it is one of the few models that requires their own drives. And they say the main reason behind this is stability and compatibility along with their own custom firmware that helps provide better performance. So yes, going forward, the, these enterprise units will require the validated drives, but not the consumer or SMB focused products. So it was good news and, and good to understand. My guess is that this is probably something that's an extension of what started with the Iron Wolf program, where the drives were sort of built with this, you know, enhanced ability. But of course, those Iron Wolf drives proved to be not nearly as reliable as you would want for enterprise stuff. Um, so there was probably a little bit of a disconnect and it was like, you know what, we'll just source our own drives and it's fine. So I, that's my speculation. I, that, that definitely, they, they have not even hinted that that's where it came from, but that's, you know, I'm just looking, I, just drawn parallels, just drawn lines, looking backwards. That's all it is. Cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right. Where are we here? Yeah, we get a little time. Um, in the post show last week, John, the concept of blockchain and specifically NFTs, non fungible tokens, came up. I think you mentioned the word fungible in the show, which is what led to that discussion uh, starting to happen. And I found it very difficult to explain what an NFT was. So I did a little bit of research this week to see if I could come up with a better way of explaining what an NFT is and why. Some of these non-fungible tokens are super valuable. And the best example I came with, uh, I could find, was an article posted by Jack Rusher at jackrusher.com, and it's already linked in the show notes, uh, that uh, equates non-fungible tokens to signed copies of an artist's painting or an artist's work in general. So you can take an artist's painting and copy it. And, uh, and that is true of any d digital data too. In fact, when you make a copy of digital data, it's an exact copy. So you literally are getting the same quality and you can replicate that millions of times. What happens though, when an artist signs their painting, even if you can make an exact copy of it, you are not making a copy of that particular artist painting and that particular signature. Right. And especially if the artist says, you know, this is if they sign it and they say this is one of 50, this is two of 50. Now, those things are unique in that way. And that is a verifiable uniqueness. Now, with an artist signature that can be forged. But let's for the moment say it we've proven that it's not forged. So now that's why this signed painting or a signed book or whatever it is, is now more valuable than the unsigned book. That's what these non-fungible tokens equate to. The difference is that by using blockchain as sort of the proof of this thing's existence and its uniqueness and its path for, of ownership, there is no forgery possible. You know that that non-fungible token that you own is yours because everyone else knows it too. The blockchain is an open confirmed 
uh, source of the history of any of these tokens. Of course, you can use it with cryptocurrency and things like that, but it can be used with lots of things. And it, it confirms that this is valid because it's open source and, and many people are confirming it. That's how blockchains work. So that's the thinking of a non-fungible token as a signed limited edition, you know, single edition of that particular signature, a one out of 50, a three out of 50, but it could be a one out of one. And then does that make it even more unique or, or more desirable because of its uniqueness? There's no such thing as more unique. It's either unique or it's not. Uh, but does that true uniqueness now make it, uh, you know, more valuable, maybe depends on what it is, right? You know, Jack's first tweet, that non-fungible token that's assigned to that, uh, obviously that's been, you know, sold for quite a bit. So, and valued quite highly. So hopefully that helps that helped me to kind of wrap it. I was actually at a party last weekend too, where somebody was asking this an outdoor socially distanced party, uh, but a party nonetheless, which was nice to see humans with warm weather and, uh, Mm -hmm. And so it was like somebody asked and I started trying to explain it in five minutes in. it was like, you know, yeah, I'm just going to get another beer. It's fine. Um, it was, it went nowhere. <laughs> so now I can do it in, in five minutes or less. <laughs> How do you explain non-fungible tokens? So it's signed paintings. There you go. Or signed books. Signed books might even be a better way because the book can be mass produced, but you know, you are signing one of them. And now that has a level of uniqueness to it or a, a, a piece of uniqueness to it. Again, there's no levels of uniqueness. All right. That's where I got. I don't know. Do you have anything to add to that, John? Yes. <laughs> uh, let's get a timestamp here. Um, there's a, a entertaining video that uh, we will link to in the show notes. Great. That also attempts to explain it. It's a uh, excellent. Great. You'll like it. You get a chuckle out of it. Mm. Oh, that's super helpful. Having different ways of looking at these things is is key. All right, cool. You want to take us to Daryl? I will take us to Daryl. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, Daryl says, I use one password for many things, especially when creating a new account for a website. My habit has been after recording my username and password to also save the initial welcome emails that these sites inevitably send inside of one inside of one password. I do this by doing a save as in mail and then select raw message source as the format that puts the file on my desktop with a .eml extension. Then I then add to one password. One password has a quick look function that brings the email up inside of one password to do the preview. Very handy. Yes. After installing Catalina on one of my machines, I noticed that the quick look function inside of one password wasn't working on newer EML items that I added to it for my desktop. I then noticed that the original EML file on my desktop were not previewing correctly either. Okay, getting clues here. After some further research, it looks like it's not 1Password's fault, but that starting in Catalina, Apple's Quick Look function itself seems to be broken when it comes to email files. Doing a quick look, uh, all right. uh, doing a quick look by using the space bar in Catalina on a file with a EML extension brings the message up, but only with its headers, not with any of the, uh, not any other data in the email. Um, unhandy. <laughs> yes. After a little more digging, I think I've come up with a fix. For whatever reason, when mail saves messages in Catalina, it adds a Windows style carriage return line feed to them instead of the way it used to do it with the old Unix style line feed only. I'm not sure if Apple did this accidentally or intentionally when this EML file is open inside any email client, all is fine, but using Quick Look to do a preview seems to be broken. So Apple should either change it back, um, uh, the raw message, uh, they should change it <laughs> or update Quick Look so it works again. Um, but he did find a fix. You can open the file in BB Editor. I'm sure any full feature text editor do an apply text transform and select change line endings to Unix. Um, apply the transform, then save the file. Uh, it should retain the EML extension. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I hate when they change things in mail and don't tell you. <laughs> yeah. That's really interesting and really interesting. That well, personally, I haven't had. Uh, 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 I haven't had any issues with Spotlight not finding emails within mail, but 
Okay. So what are you saying is that the exported message format is broken or quick look is broken or they're both broken. Well, they're just out of sync with each other. I think is the issue. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, well, I, you know, I think that's about where we have to wrap it up, John. I, I, Mm. you know, our, our time is, uh, our time is short. The good news is that we get to do this again next week together. So that, you know, that's good. Make sure to send in your stuff. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. If you are a premium contributor, uh, then send in your stuff to premium at MacGeekGab.com because that's part of what you get as a premium contributor is access to that email address. That we prioritize. We really do try to get through everything. And most weeks we succeed. Uh, but the premium address is is very much prioritized by us here. And, uh, and we appreciate your, your support. If A, you're able. And B, you're interested. It is not mandatory. We love that you listen and all of that. I do want to take a second and thank all of our premium contributors for the last week or two here. Uh, I guess it's just the last week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Roger Y. Barry from wherever he might be overhead. I know he's been able to travel a little bit too. Uh, Craig from Pace. Ciro from Matawan. Chris from Windsor. Windsor. Uh, Michelle from Quebec. Stephen from Costa Mesa. Everett from Colorado. Olga from Bellevue. Clifton from Newhall. Jason from Charleston. Jeffrey from Windsor, Martin from Carlsbad, Stephen from Granger, Jonathan from Woodside, Matt from Memphis, Ralph from Bangor, Paul from Pomona, and Larry from Alpharetta. Thanks so much. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to MacGeekCab.com slash premium where you can uh, learn about how we have that program going and what your options are. It's very quite flexible because it's, you know, really just how you want to help. So... All right, uh, that's what we got here. That's what we've explained how to find us on Twitter. We've explained how to email us. You can call us, 224-888-GEEK, which, John, is? 4335. Great. That is 4335. I believe that's right. I call that every now and then just to, uh, just to, just mm-hmm. to make sure it works. Well, so many of you are using the app now, which is freely available on iOS and for your M1 Max. Uh And you can not only listen to the show and participate in the chat room, but you can also leave your feedback. And if you leave feedback during an episode, like while you're listening, it will tag the timestamp and the chapter name of the uh, of the chapter, the active chapter. So we know what you were responding to, which is sometimes really helpful to give it that context. And yes, our show always, almost always, but certainly for well more than a decade has had chapters. So if your podcatcher, whatever app you use to play your podcast, supports chapters, which most of them do now, uh, you can navigate through. And if there's something we're talking about that doesn't interest you, you can skip ahead. Or if there's something you, we, we talked about that you want to hear again, you can jump back. So feel free to make use of those chapters. We actually go out of our way to really make sure that those chapters are valuable for you. Uh, and the, and our app supports that too. Our app is free, so uh, you know, obviously, feel free to go get it. We will put it out there. All right, that's what we got. That's what that's what I have for today. You got anything else for today, John? Before it's time to uh, wave goodbye for the final time. Nah, I'm gonna go watch uh, Easter Yeggs. All right, sounds like fun. Uh, folks, I hope you have a good week. Make sure to check out our sponsors. As I said at the beginning clearme.com slash macgeekgub textexpander.com slash podcast helixsleep.com slash mgg of course you can learn all about all of our sponsors at macgeekgub.com slash sponsors have fun don't do anything we wouldn't do stay safe and uh, don't get caught we'll see you next week made up. We are out.